one of the things that I was just considering this seminar, I was wondering was where we first pick up our ideas of leadership. And certainly talking to my family, Heather was talking about hers. It's obvious that the first instincts one possibly has are from children's books, where there's so often examples of heroic leadership, whether you're talking about something like Swallows and Amazons or going right along the, the path to Enid Blyton or the Knights of the Round Table. They're about a single successful person leading a group in some adventure. And I think that's something that we, in a sense, carry forward. And one of those aspects of it which has been very much emphasised in the last few months has been that individual military leadership. I think in the commemorations of the First World War, which we've all been very moved and impressed by in the last few months in, in the recollections of 100 years since 1914, we've seen many examples of really inspirational soldiers literally individually leading their troops, leading in the position of great danger to themselves uh, as they charged out of their trenches. And today, of course, we hear contemporary count accounts of similar heroics in places like Afghanistan and perhaps, I'm afraid, maybe even again in Iraq. But for most of us, I think, in our lives, either that sort of childish ideal of the individual leader or the rather glamorous one of the heroic person leading a troop of people is not perhaps the way in which we look at leadership and I certainly don't think from my experience that that's the most successful analogy most of us can pick up in terms of our own lives where leadership I experience is much less glamorous but equally responsible. In my very long life of um, working in various different parts of the world and in different parts of the working experience, I've had a chance to really observe different types of working environment, but also very different types of leadership. And I just set out a few examples when in the media, it's a very different world, perhaps more equivalent in terms of the immediate crisis or the drama which occurs when you're making a television program or a radio program or trying to get something on the air that will induce people to take rather heroic positions which may or may not be ones followed by their companions and their colleagues. I've also worked a great deal in the voluntary sector with NGOs, both individually, internationally and nationally. And sometimes I've said in that context that leadership is so developed by consultation that it's almost leadership by group therapy. And I'm not sure I would use that experience as one that I wanted to take forward particularly. And of course, in politics and in government, leadership is very important. But to me, the best and most successful forms of leadership are not the ones that necessarily follow the individual model. I think that most often, it's much more complicated role of leading a team and building a consensus for other people to follow of your peer group. I would, if I was asked to sort of put it down in a simple acronym, one of those things where you answer a newspaper interview, what's your view of leadership? I would put it down to three Cs, and those would be clarity, confidence, and consultation. And those, I think, are some of the main reasons that I find it important to emphasize, as Heather was doing in her opening remarks, and I hope we come back to that, the role of women in leadership. And I'll say a couple of words about that in a minute. But whether I've been traveling with a film crew, as I did for many years, or sitting on a PLC board, as I've now done for many years since I left frontline government, or particularly when I was involved in the frontline politics and in government as a minister, I think the team leap approach to leadership is the one that works best. One person may be in the media context the presenter, or may in the board context be the chairman, or in the business context, the chief executive, or in government, the minister, but they're only really the, as it were, the front person for what should be a successful team. But by giving clear, confident leadership on a constantly agreed and, as it were, unconflicted strategy, they're the ones who will achieve most. And as I said just now, I would like to flag, flag up the question of women leaders, something which we, I hope, as I say, we will return to in the panel discussion, particularly with this team of people who we are um, sitting with this morning. I think this is somewhere where I've seen the greatest revolution in my working lifetime, not only just the number of women 
who are working, but the number of women who are working in very senior positions. And just one headline on this for now, which I'm sure is probably familiar to many in this audience, but we have now achieved 22% of non-executive directors on FTSE 100 companies this year. Now, that hasn't been done just by osmosis. It's been done by a lot of work, led particularly by some individuals who picked this up as a particular business strategy. But as someone who sat for many years as a single female person on a PLC board, on two PLC boards, in fact, it is, to me, a great change that has happened and one which I think is an advantage. And I think it's true to say, although I haven't seen this verified because it must be difficult to do so, that there are no business boards now that are on the FTSE 100 or the FTSE 250 of companies where there is no female non-executive at all. And I think that's something we should recognize. And one of the reasons that I think it's particularly important to recognize it is that I think, and this is a gender point and one which may be challenged, I think women are more instinctively attracted to the notion of leadership that I've spoken about, of the three C's, of being confident, about being collaborative, and about being, as it were, clear about what you want to achieve. And I know from all of the experience that I've had in politics that when you have an, a group of women, it's not just an, a matter of having one on the board, a token one, which was always true in the 90s and the early 2000s when I first sat on PLC boards. It is about having a critical mass of women. It doesn't have to be a dominant group, but it can be a, a sense in which they reinforce those three C concepts that I'm headlining, as I say, open to challenge, but that they're the ones I'm headlining, that you do find that the most sensible expression of di different but collaborative views can be advanced. And then when the chairman of the board or the chief executive or the minister is the person who is of a different gender, they have that experience around them and in front of them. And I think that's the way in which you achieve success. And that's the sort of team leadership that I would like to express as being something which I feel we should advance in many different environments. And I look forward to the panel's views, probably disagreeing with that. And as I say, to the experts in the room who have more experience of teaching these values and may have very different values they want to project. But that's my small contribution from a position of long life rather than great learning. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you.